Amen. And then these, this is what you need to do. The same thing David did, all right? First of all, you've got to give honor to those who deserve honor. Amen? Give honor to those who deserve honor. One of the outstanding legacies of David's life is that he knew how to give honor to people. He gave honor to those who God had called into a position of honor. In particular, David always honored those who had been anointed by the Lord. I remember the story in the Word where a man came to David after Saul had been killed. And, and he thought to himself, and many in that day thought, well, you know, Saul was David's enemy, so if I kill Saul, David is probably going to be the next king. People recognize his, you know, his up-and-comingness. And, and uh, they, they, he thought, man, I'm going to get some kind of a reward for doing this. But how many of you know he didn't get the reward he thought he was going to get because David was grieved that the anointed of the Lord was, uh, was, had been killed. And so David actually had the man killed for lifting his hand against the Lord's anointed. And what was so interesting, if you study the passages, that not only was David grieved by Saul's death, but all the men that were around David were, were, were so in tune with David's spirit and wanting to honor the anointed one of the Lord, to honor the king, to honor the one that God had chosen, that all of them were actually grieved in the same way. And most of these men had been living actually as exiles from the nation of Israel. And yet when Saul was killed, they were grieved. Let me read the scripture for you. 2 Samuel 1, verse 11, it says, Then David, and notice what it says, all the men with him, took hold of their clothes and tore them. And they mourned and wept and fasted till evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the army of the Lord and the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. How often could each one of us use our influence to give honor to those who deserve honor? How many times have you been at the water fountain at work or, or in the break room or in the lobby of a church or, you know, at the family reunion and, and, and you realize that your comment could turn the whole situation around and bring honor to somebody? Amen. Let me tell you, I believe that's what we need to do as believers. Come on. We need to honor our father and our mother. Honor your boss. Honor the one who's teaching. Honor those who have leadership over you. Honor those who labor hard among you honor those who achieve honor those who study hard and I want, I want to say this one honor those who have tried and failed come on because at least they tried come on somebody let me tell let me challenge you today to be a person of a different character than those around you use your place of influence to honor those around you and so as God established David's kingdom, there came a point when, you know, Saul's house had been diminished and David, and David's influence was firmly established. He was completely reigning as king. And what did David do? Instead of looking around and saying, I wonder who can honor me, what he did was he looked for somebody that he could honor. 2 Samuel 9, 1 said this, David asked, Is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And a search was made. You may remember the story. They looked all and they found Jonathan's son, a, a, a boy who had been dropped, who was lame. His name was Mephibosheth. And so what David did was David honored him by restoring all of Saul's lands to him, giving him servants to work the land. David told Mephibosheth, Look, look, I I want you to come and you're going to sit at the king's table with all of my sons. Amen. What a beautiful thought. David used his influence to show kindness to the weak. He honored the former king's grandson by making him one of his own sons at his own table. And then David used his influence to honor the strong, right? We not only have to honor the weak, we have to honor the strong. No other king had a list of mighty men except David. He had a long list of mighty men. David himself was an awesome, great warrior. You can read of the expansion of the kingdom underneath, uh, underneath his rule and underneath his reign. And I'm certain as they sat around, you know, David and his mighty men and recounted the stories, it wasn't just all about David. Hello? Each one had their own story to tell. And David probably honored them and no doubt honored them because those men loved David. They would even risk their life to get him a drink of water. And you see, some people, they don't have any problem honoring the weak 
right? Some people don't have any problem with that. But you allow another strong person to rise up into their sphere of influence, they have trouble with that because they want to be the only strong one. And so we've got to learn how to give honor, amen? You know, years ago, Jeff Williams said to me, he said, look, if you're going to give flowers to somebody, give them flowers while they're alive, amen? Amen. So we've got to honor people. And in our church, we have what we call reflected praise. How many have ever heard of that before? Let me tell you what we want to do here at Fountain of Life. Let's put this into action. How many of you think we ought to not just preach the word, we ought to do the word? Hello? So here's what we want to do here at Fountain of Life. It's called reflected praise. Whenever anybody gives you a compliment, you reflect it to somebody else. Let me tell you how it works. Say, for example, someone would come to Jereen and say, Wow, Sister Jereen, man, that worship sure touched my heart. Thank you. Jereen would reflect the praise. She would say, You want to know that why that is? It's because we have some great musicians who practice, and they're spiritual, and the Holy Spirit was just flowing through the musicians. And so they go to the musicians, and they say, Wow, you were so awesome on that guitar, on those drums on that keyboard and the musicians say you know something it really isn't me I don't have much to do with it you see we have anointed singers that sing and worship the Lord and it's because of them that 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 uh, you know that 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 we you, the Holy Spirit is flowing in our worship, and so you go to the singers to tell them thank you for your ministry and all that you do. And the singers say something like this: "Well, it really has nothing to do with us because you see, there's a group of people in this church who pray for us all the time, and they're constantly lifting us up to the Lord and prayer. So you find the prayer warriors and you thank the prayer warriors and you tell them thank you so much for praying for us, and they say listen." I didn't do anything. All I did was ask the Lord. He's the one that gets all the credit. He's the one that gets all the glory. Come on. How many of you think we ought to have reflected praise in this house? Amen. We don't take the praise for ourselves. We bounce it off one another until finally the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, King Jesus, gets all the praise. Come on. Give him a big hand of praise today. Amen. That can be true in any other scenario as well. Not just the worship house. Amen. Part. Amen. Number two. The second thing. If you want to be strong in a season of influence. And be faithful in a season of influence. You've got to make God's house a priority. Tell your neighbor. Make God's house a priority. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir this morning. Amen. Y'all know what that means. Right? Amen. The choir's the ones that's always here. All right. Amen. David used his influence to establish the priority of God's house. If you read 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles, you'll see that David spent a massive amount of time and energy establishing worship in the city of Jerusalem. He wanted the Ark of the Covenant to be brought. But you know something? He didn't tell him, just go get the Ark of the Covenant. David went himself and got the Ark of the Covenant. He danced before the Lord with all of his might because he knew that that Ark of the Covenant carried the manifested presence of the Lord upon it. And that's what he wanted in, in, in the worship in Jerusalem. What a joyous occasion it was as they brought the Ark of the Covenant into the city of David. And it was David who had the heart to build a temple for for the Lord. David looked around at the house that he was living in and he said to himself, here I am dwelling in a house built of cedar. It's beautiful. It's adorned. And the tabernacle of the Lord is where the Lord dwells in a tent. And he, he thought, I've got to build a temple for the Lord. You know, his hands had been too bloody. God didn't allow him to do it. But let me tell you what he did do. He got everything ready so that his son could build it, all right? I mean, and as you read through the Word, you see a lot of his energy and time was caused in bringing all these things to, the, to, to, to Jerusalem, the resources, the, the wood, the gold, everything that was needed to build the temple. David used his influence and honor to establish the house of the Lord. And wasn't it David that established the choirs and the singers and the musicians and all of that. David is the one who has written many of the psalms, amen, that are still used in corporate worship today. Amen. And no place in God's word is David's attitude towards the house of the Lord seen more than in Psalms 122 and verse number 1 when David says this, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I wonder is there anybody here that feels that way today? You get up on Sunday morning and you you say praise God I get to go to church this morning and worship the King of Kings and the 
Lord of Lords. Amen. David was a frequenter of God's house. We remember we're talking about the season of influence. David was the governor. He could have said, man, I've been ruling and reigning all week. I don't think I'm going today. But not David. He, he went and, and, and he, he was, used that influence. Many people, unfortunately, when they get to a season of influence, decide that the house of the Lord is not as important as it once was. It's when you're in the season of adversity. Hello? You're saying something like this. I don't know if you've ever said it. I've said it. If I can just get to church, I'm going to be all right. Has anybody ever thought that? If I can just get to where the presence of God is, if I can just find myself in a place where the Spirit of the Lord is moving, if I can get myself through a prayer meeting or a Bible study or somewhere, I know that my spirit's going to be encouraged and I'm going to be all right. Amen. But let me tell you, when you get in the season of influence, it's easy to just kind of chill out. Uh, a few years ago, there was a great movie called The Pursuit of Happiness. Who's seen that movie? Anybody seen that? That's an awesome movie. A true story, by the way. And there's a, there's a scene in that movie. Will Smith, uh, what a phenomenal actor he was. He's, he's, he's in church, right? And, and the pastor's up there preaching. He's got his little boy. And, and you, I remember that little scene. And, and, and he's crying, and the pastor's preaching. And it's like, you know, when I saw that, my spirit just rejoiced. I'm like, oh, thank you, God. Anytime I get a, a, something that's positive about church where God's encouraging people in the movies, it makes me really happy. Come on. So anyway, I was watching, and I thought, that is so awesome. Amen. There's this man, and he's in church with his, with his son. He was a single dad, and how he must have been struggling, and he was struggling through all of that. But I wondered to myself, as I watched that, I thought, I wonder. At the end of the movie, I thought, I wonder if he stayed faithful to the house of God. Once he was blessed and highly favored. Because you see, it's easy once you get enough money to buy a cabin or a boat or season tickets. or All these things can pull you away from the Lord. My father-in-law, late father-in-law, Vinnie Gerdes, owned cabins up in Minnesota for many years. And, and uh, we would frequent the cabin. But uh, it would happened to be that on Saturday night, didn't matter who was there, he would make this announcement, we're all going to church tomorrow morning. We'll all be ready at 8.45, and we will all leave together. Sunday school. By the way, it wasn't just church. It was Sunday school and then church and then back again for Sunday night. If you were there on Wednesday, it didn't matter. You went to church on Wednesday. Even if you were hunting or fishing or whatever, you came in and you went to church. I tell you something, I've got to honor my father-in-law for that. Amen. How were you raised? Is there anybody who was raised in the church all the time? Amen. Amen. Your mother drug you to church. Your daddy drug you to church. Amen. You you went to church. Come on. Amen. That's the way I was raised. Amen. That's the way I, I raised my own children. Amen. If the, the church was open, we were there. Now, I'm not saying that if you've got to work and it's impossible for you to be, I'm not throwing any stones at anybody. If you're sick, you can't be here. Come on. But uh, some people think, well, isn't there more to Christianity than coming to church? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I, I think that that must be one of the foundational pieces. I was talking about going to church one time to somebody years ago, and they said, well, I go to the invisible church. I said, well, I wonder who's going to preach your funeral, the invisible pastor? Who prays for you when you're sick, the invisible deacon? Hello? Who, who, who? <laughs> Oh, anyway, anyway, I could go on and on with that one. But anyway, we've got to have the attitude that faithfulness to the house of God is something to be aspired to, right? Hebrews 10, 25 says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. How many of you believe that Jesus is coming? Amen. How many of you watch the news and you say, man, that's a sign, that's a sign. Look what's happening in Israel. That's a sign. You see all those things happen. Listen, when you see that, you know this scripture that God says, listen, as you see those things happening, we're not to go to church less and less as actually is the trend today. We're actually to go to church more and more. Come on, somebody. I'm preaching really good today.